the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Good to be here. And Megan Lords from Bitcoins, not bombs. Thanks for having me. Moving on to issue one. Two-bit idiot withdraws threat against the Bitcoin Foundation. He said he had the evidence for a war. He said he was going nuclear. All he did was destroy his own credibility. Once the noted leaker of the Mt. Gox presentation, now merely a two-bit idiot. But what about his claims? Should the Bitcoin Foundation have warned people about Mt. Gox? Should they have stricter standards for Bitcoin exchanges, especially Bitcoin Foundation board members? I ask you, Christoph Atlas. Um, I think the whole Bitcoin Foundation stuff is a bit of a yawn for me. Um, I don't care too much about the Bitcoin Foundation. I think the idea of having a centralized organization that's somehow going to um, coordinate the efforts of a decentralized currency is kind of silly in, in old world. Um, so I, I can't get too, too excited about it. As far as what their responsibilities are, I mean, it would, certainly would be nice if they had uh, done more to warn people about Mt. Gox. Now, keep in mind that some of the people on the board, um, they have conflicts of interest with Mt. Gox. So it, that puts them in a bit of a sticky situation because, first of all, I mean, there's not that many huge people in the Bitcoin world to be on this foundation, right? So conflicts of interests are pretty difficult to avoid entirely. But uh, let's say that they had warned people, then people would be saying, well, he has a, a company that's competing with Mt. Gox. It's a conflict of interest. This is not within the purview of, you know, the Bitcoin foundation. So I can sympathize with being kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place on, on that. Um, I'm not sure that they have any particular, particular moral duty. It's just, you know, it's a voluntary organization that people can donate to or not donate to. People can pay attention to it or not pay attention to it. I do think it's important for us to make a very clear distinction between the Bitcoin Foundation and the Bitcoin company, which doesn't exist, right? You know, it's, it's just a, it's an organization. Um, they can consider themselves to be very important, but you know, very fundamentally, I don't think that it matters too much for the, the long term of Bitcoin. And um, just it's important to make it clear that if something goes wrong with the Bitcoin Foundation, it doesn't have anything in particular to do with Bitcoin. It's just this isolated uh, organization that is around the Bitcoin scene, but is not equivalent to Bitcoin. Megan Lords. If you declare war, you need to bring the bombs. Um, so what 2-Bit Idiot did was he brought in a lot of hype, but didn't really produce anything. And I, I was glad to see him kind of backtrack and, you know, apologize at least. But it was a very strange apology where he was like, oh, I still have the information. It's like, release it if you do. But it's also something that I can't really get excited about in general uh, as far as the Bitcoin Foundation. I pretty much agree with Christoph on this. It's not something that I pay a whole lot of attention to because they don't represent me as a person in Bitcoin. And this whole idea that we need these protections on people, that they should have been telling people not to use Mt. Gox, I think is kind of silly and it, it goes completely against the idea of Bitcoin, which is self-accountability and self-responsibility. There were a lot of individual Bitcoiners who were saying, saying, hey, get out of Gox, it's not good. But of course, you know, our, our reach was limited. You had all of these new people coming in. Uh, you know, the first thing that would pop up when you type in Bitcoin on Google would be Mt. Gox. So a lot of them just didn't know. Uh, but it's not really the foundation's responsibility to tell them that. It's, uh, it's, it's up to the market, really. And, you know, we, we saw what happened with Gox. It was obviously terrible, and people had been saying for months to get out. But it wasn't the foundation's responsibility to do that. I don't really uh, believe that there should be a centralized foundation anyway. And yeah, I don't, and as far as stricter, yeah, stricter standards for Bitcoin exchanges, I don't. You know, I, I'd like to see a more decentralized approach anyway. I'm not a huge fan of exchanges in the first place. One thing I'll just throw in there is that 
the Bitcoin Foundation, it's not their responsibility as long as they're not claiming it, right? If they're like, we are Bitcoin, you know, we <laughs> everything that you need to know about Bitcoin goes through us. We make the biggest decisions. We are the Bitcoin dictators of the world. Uh, then I guess they're assuming the responsibility. Um, I don't really know about what they've claimed as responsibility, though, because I don't really pay attention to them. Um, so, you know, it, it's possible for them to take on that responsibility if they're going to go ahead and say that they're doing that. I believe Christoph made a good point when he said, there is no Bitcoin the company. In the absence of a Bitcoin the company, it does seem we need something like the Bitcoin Foundation to let people know what Bitcoin's up to and presumably, at the very least, to pay Gavin Andreessen, the lead developer of Bitcoin. Now, whether it should be the Bitcoin Foundation we have right now or a different one, I'm not sure, but you bring up a good point on Gox. What could they have done? If they had warned people, it would look like they're causing Gox to collapse, which would have, of course, caused Gox to collapse, whereas they did nothing and they allowed Gox to collapse. The real problem could be is if, as 2-Bit Idiot said, if he has evidence of insider trading, if they use their access to Carpellus to get privileges that other users didn't have, that might not be acceptable, but it doesn't look like we're going to find out because 2-Bit Idiot has clammed up. And this, this uh, insider trading is the kind of thing that we could detect if we have audits, which was not going, out at, going on at Gox. And that's something that I think should be covered in audits in the future of these exchanges. Uh, make sure that everything is secure and fair as well, uh, because we don't have any, you know, any government uh, outside organizations keeping a watch on any of this stuff. It's, it's up to the market to provide uh, information about this. And certainly as a, an exchange user, I, I care whether, uh, you know, there's, there's someone that can jump in front of line uh, ahead of me at an exchange. The Gox situation has certainly been a, a learning point for Bitcoin. I think that the new exchanges are going to be cryptograph cryptographically proven, they're going to be stronger, and they're not going to be run by one person. So while I hate to say we had a learning opportunity with so many people's money missing, we had a learning opportunity. Exit question. What should 2-Bit Idiot have done? If you were in his shoes, what would you have done? Christoph Atlas. That is an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure what I, what I would have done. I'm, I'm not sure if he has a particular responsibility. I mean, he received some insider information. When it came to the Mt. Gox stuff, he released it, and people seemed to be happy with that decision. Uh, it gave, it was, people are able to make more informed decisions based on receiving that information about Mt. Gox. And I kind of wonder, you know, would this, Gox stuff had had you know dragged out even longer if that information had not come to light. Um, it wasn't very long before Mt. Gox shut down. That Marco Pellis was just saying, uh, "Oh, we're making some great changes. You know, just wait until Monday. It's going to be up again. You know, all that kind of stuff." So I guess I, in general, I favor um, you know the the release of information. I can understand that he's trying to make a judgment call by saying that you know. There's a lot of stuff going on with Bitcoin right now and a lot of stuff that can be interpreted negatively by the, uh, the mainstream media. And so let's not, let's not pile on some more stuff right now. Um, you know, if he wants to make that judgment call, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'm not sure exactly what I would have done in that situation. I probably would have released it, but he's, you know, if he had released it, then there would be some people that hated him for releasing it. So it might be a kind of a no-win situation for him. Megan Lords. I don't know enough about the details of the situation. I don't know what information he's seen or has in his possession. So I don't know that I could make a judgment call on what I would have done. I hope that, um, you know, if, if there was some severe, uh, obviously there was, there was some severe problems happening in the situation. I'm always for the truth coming out, but I, I definitely understand why he wouldn't want to release it. Right now, I mean, the media is having a frenzy with, with the Gox situation and trying to demonize Bitcoin, and it could very well feed into that. So, like I said, I, I don't know what information he has. Maybe it's so serious that he's uh, afraid for his life. I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's not as serious as he perhaps thought it was, and releasing it would just not really make that much of a difference. So it comes down to what he has, what he's seeing, and the importance of that information and relevance of it. 
I'm with Christoph on this one. If you've got the information, release it. Don't even bother with this ultimatum article. Just let it go. Let the people decide if it's bad, if it's worse. Let the people decide. I if think the ultimatum, sorry to interrupt you, but I think the ultimatum thing is kind of like, at that point it becomes less about what's the best for the welfare of Bitcoin and more about what's exciting and fun for a two-bit idiot. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of people raising that question, how much of it is a matter of ego. And it's kind of hard to see how he can uh, hope to centrally plan the Bitcoin information to the extent that he's, you know, making demands about who needs to step down from this organization and so forth. So, yeah, I think those are some fair criticisms to, to levy his way. And his original article did have a lot of hyperbolic language. He mentioned attacking, going nuclear. He went well overboard, and I think it was difficult to back up after that to do anything. So it's kind of trapped. Moving on, issue two, Bitcoin Foundation adds DC talent. The former director for the Cato Institute and a former White House press secretary joined the team at the Bitcoin Foundation, calling it a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The Bitcoin Foundation is now turning towards DC and opening an office in London. Is this the right future for the Bitcoin Foundation? What is your idea of a dream Bitcoin Foundation? Megan Lords. I don't have a dream Bitcoin Foundation in mind. I, I don't really uh, believe they're absolutely necessary to the longer success of Bitcoin, but if you are going to play the DC game, if you're going to be talking with these politicians in DC, then you have to be able to speak their language. Of course, a DC insider who used to be a press secretary would be perfect at doing that. She's going to have a better understanding of the rhetoric they use, and uh, and then the the person from Cato too. I mean, that's that's great if you want to play that game. You have to use their language and their tactics. But I don't play that game. I, I don't do the politics thing. I don't have a dream idea of a Bitcoin foundation. I really don't pay much attention to it. We're joined by Will Penguin from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Will, what's your idea of a dream Bitcoin foundation? What do you think of the new members recently added to the Bitcoin foundation team? You're still muted and delayed. Okay, we're having issues reaching, Will. We'll see if that works out. Christoph, your ideas. Yeah, um, my first reaction to this news was, bleh. Um, so I looked at the Bitcoin Foundation website earlier, and they have this link. <laughs> There's a section of the website called Why We Need a Foundation, which to me um, sounds kind of desperate. Like, how many organizations have a why this organization needs to exist a section of their website? But I'm just going to read you part of it, right? So, um, uh, our vision, a peer-to-peer -peer organization, we are determined to keep Bitcoin rooted in its core principles, non-political economy, openness, and independence. And it goes on from there, right? So, I want to, I, then I went to look LinkedIn, and I looked at the resume for this woman that they just added. Um, so, let's see. Uh, she's the... Uh, vice President, or she was the Vice President of Public Affairs for the United Nations Foundation, uh, the Senior Vice President of Communications for the RIAA, Ooh. Uh, Director of Public Affairs for some company I've never heard of, Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Press Secretary for the White House, Communications Director and Press Secretary for the Democratic National Committee, uh, communications director for the strictly nonpartisan, of course, Campaign for America. Uh, congressional press secretary, campaign manager for a U.S. representative, Democrat from Oklahoma. And it kind of goes on from there. So my question is, what is the Bitcoin Foundation doing that is useful when they get involved into this politics stuff? They're burning through money that was given through to the foundation. I guess the idea is that they're going to be able to participate in this kind of back office politics that uh, everyone else is participating in. But I'm a little bit skeptical that this is useful. I think that you're trying to outspend 
uh, the bankers that want to shut down Bitcoin. It's in their you know very selfish interest to to try and accomplish something like that. And there's no way that the Bitcoin Foundation is going to be outspending J.P. Morgan Chase. That's a silly goal, right? So I'm concerned that when they bring in more people from Washington, which, by the way, is the exact opposite of what people have been calling for when they talk about the Bitcoin Foundation. They always say, oh, it should be less U.S.-centric. It should be less to do with these you know, insider people in Washington or Silicon Valley. And what they did was they brought in two more Washington politicos, uh, which is, to me, kind of gross. Um, and I'm concerned that this is just a big... Uh, a funnel for money to, you know, take useful bitcoins that uh, was earned by all the early adopters and deposit them to useless people uh, that are lawyers and, you know, lobbyists and so forth. Um, I think it's a bit of a, a drain. I wonder what we could have accomplished if we had taken all that money and given it to software developers instead. Um, how much could we have circumvented uh, censorship by the government instead of trying to argue with the government about censorship? Uh, these are the kind of things that I wonder about when I see these kind of decisions by the Bitcoin Foundation. And it's one of the reasons why I'm generally not interested in getting involved with the organization. I know this is not the only thing that they do, but it's the it's the main thing that we hear about from the foundation, and um, you know, it's it's something that I'm not personally interested in. It does look like they're getting rid of their non-political ideas and ramping up for a political fight. While I agree we're not going to match J.P. Morgan, we should at least put up a battle. And if the Bitcoin Foundation puts a positive image out there for Bitcoin, we're going to need that positive image as much as we won't be able to fight their negativity. We're also joined by Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Will, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you guys. Do you have any thoughts on the Bitcoin Foundation and the uh, new members that they've recently added? Yeah, so I, I, I'm not 100% uh, sure the exact distinctions, but I know there are distinctions between Foundation employees and Foundation members. So, for example, I'm a Foundation member. You know, I've been relatively active on the Education Committee. And I, you know, don't really... It's, one thing I can attest to is that it's been um, somewhat a chore sometimes to get any communication between the committee that I've been on for several months now and the board. Um, and I think there's a lot of worthwhile functions that they are performing, certainly you know, interfacing with uh, regulators, governments, and kind of um, working with these in very important and big Bitcoin startups and Bitcoin businesses that are in the space and have, you know, pioneered um, a lot of territory for Bitcoin itself. And I would even include Mt. Gox in that category. We all are familiar with their their struggles and dishonesty, and it appears. But uh, certainly, they played a very valuable function in the early days. And I think the foundation is is doing that. I think there's a lot more it can do. I have lots of ideas about that. Um, I'm also interested in seeing, uh, you know, I think Christoph made a good point about the allocation of resources. You know, there's, there's this uh, pretty well endowed, it would seem, foundational body that its mission is to standardize, protect, and promote Bitcoin. And it certainly has been doing that when it comes to governments and regulators. Um, to the best of its ability, I believe. That's what I've seen. But there's a lot of other things that are lacking because perhaps maybe all their attention is being paid to that. And we can argue the merits of how, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but the point is it has to happen in, you know, for Bitcoin to continue to grow. Um, it's not going to go unnoticed by large corporations, banks, and governments. You're going to have to contend um, and participate with that you know, um, at some point. And so to do so as amicably as possible is advantageous to all parties involved and to try and um, facilitate the understanding, the thorough understanding of this new technology and its potentials is incredibly important so that, you know, we've all seen what happens when, when innovations that are poorly understood, I mean, we, we can see it in the press all the time and even in statements by senators who want to ban the thing, that um, the, the lack of understanding leads to some, I'm sorry to say it, some it is idiocy, you know, running amok. And so cleaning that up is a hugely important task and 
the foundation seems to me to be really the only logical group um, at, at present to to be a point of contact for the state, for, for governments, for, for banks, and for large corporations that, you know, have, have competing interests, let's say. So that's, I think that's valuable. Um, in ongoing, you know, there's been a definite lack of community interfacing on the foundation's part as a whole, and certainly the board as well. So some things I'm working on are to bridge that. And, um, you know, now's the time. Obviously, there's lots of, you know, the 2-Bit Idiot's getting lots of website hits. He's writing lots of great link bait ever since his antagonistic letter a week ago. And, um, you know, he's putting things out there that I think resonate with the sentiments of lots of people in the community as well. So, our, you know, a lot of people think the foundation can go away and everything will proceed just fine and dandy. I think that's probably true, but while, while it's here, you know, it's performing a valuable function. It can continue to perform. Um, and uh, as for leadership changes, you know, I don't know if that's what's needed. I don't know enough to say that. In fact, I think I've seen a lot of decent leadership in a lot of ways from the board and board members I've been talking to directly on occasion. But what I, um, what I haven't seen is enough action in the community or with the user base. And that's something I'm looking forward to um, having a role in facilitating. I agree, Will. I'd like to see more community on the uh, Bitcoin Foundation. Exit question. Two empty seats on the board. Who would you like to see added to the board of the Bitcoin Foundation? Megan Lords. I think the foundation has sent a clear message with who they've already selected and it's looking like they're really wanting to play the politics game, which is a filthy game, by the way. Um, and I don't know. It's, at the end of the day, it's not up to me who they add. They're going to add more political people is what it looks like. I'd like to see a couple anarchists add there to maybe uh, make things interesting. But I don't have any specific names. I again, I think the whole um, the whole foundation, what they're doing as far as outreach and education is awesome. What Will said about kind of bridging that gap with the community and the you know higher up members, I, I think is definitely necessary. But I think you're seeing that gap kind of widening. Um, I don't have, like I said, I don't have specific names. I, I'd like to see some, I guess, disruptive elements thrown on there, but I really don't think that's going to happen. I think they're really going to lean more towards the political side of things, and I think that's really unfortunate because this system was not designed for people to win. This was, this is a very old, long entrenched system. It's been around for a very long time and is slowly dying. And I'd like to see more focus on outside the system solutions, uh, you know, some privacy solutions, security solutions, uh, coming out of the technology side of things and not so much a focus on, well, what do we do politically? What do we have to do to satisfy these dinosaurs who are very comfortable with their power? Will Pangman. Um, one name that jumps to mind is Brock Pierce. He's been really out in public and actively involved, and he's one of the earliest adopters, or at least, um, you know, he's in 2009 he was mining bitcoins. I know, um, but uh, he's he's someone who's had success in the Bitcoin space as an entrepreneur and in other areas as an entrepreneur, and he's not the only one. Um, but he, he'd be good. I know his values align and we're attracted to Bitcoin's core principles, you know, some of the things that a lot of us on the panel attracted us to. And uh, he's also someone who deals with uh, governments quite a bit. I know most of his more um, successful ventures are in Asia, South Korea, Ch China, and, and Singapore, and things like that. So um, certainly he has the... I don't know, global appeal or global reach um, experience, and then the industry experience as well, too. I like that concept. Um, and then I would like to see some folks who I think wouldn't probably assume a, a role or, you know, maybe haven't in the past, and maybe that's evidence for it. You know, Roger Veer, Eric Voorhees, Nicholas Carey of Blockchain, um, you know, and just these are two industry seats, so I'm not thinking of community advocates um, of course, there are many of those as well. You know, I think uh, Chris J would would be great as a board member for a community seat, 
Um, maybe even an industry seat. I'm not sure of his level of involvement um, that would merit that or warrant that. But uh, and then of course Andreas. I think he wouldn't take it. He would want to do that, but he'd be a fantastic um, ambassador there too. So um, those would be my choices, and I think um, you know their terms are going to run out, and they're going to most likely you know be replaced with some other capable people. I I want to make it clear that the new hires of the foundation. While having like political backgrounds and stuff, we don't really know their politics. I'm interested to find that out. You know, that'll that'll show me a lot um, and tell, help me decide what they're all about. But they're not board members too. Is the other important thing. Um, so, you know, they're they're hired. They're you know they're employees of the foundation to perform the functions. I think it's clear they're just job descriptions describe. So um, yeah, I'd like to see them in action, and then we can determine what their politics are. I, I think Bitcoin needs to be very apolitical. Of course, you have to interface with governments, but we need to, I think, avoid the political things as much as possible. You know, Christoph Atlas. I don't see any evidence for the idea to support the idea that we need to interface with governments at all. Here's my warning to supporters of the Bitcoin Foundation: when you bring political people into your your organization, and the the two people that were brought on are obviously very very political people, people that have worked for the White House, people that worked for the Cato Institute. When you try to lobby the government, when you try to change the system within, what happens instead is the system changes you. And so what the more that we bring people like this into the, the Bitcoin foundation, I use we in the loosest sense possible, then the more that the foundation is going to direct itself towards these kind of government interfacing efforts. And of course, the, the, the problem with these efforts is that they can't possibly be measured. They, they'll say things like, ah, yes, we're having very good talks with these senators behind closed doors. How do we know? We have no clue, no ability to measure the efficacy of these efforts whatsoever. All we know is that they will cost money. So that would be my caution to the Bitcoin Foundation, and more, mainly for the supporters of the Bitcoin Foundation, because I think the foundation is going to do whatever they, they, you know, they sort of want to do. Um, as for who would, you know, who would be my ideal people for taking uh, positions to the board, non-political people, people that are going to help us spread Bitcoin to new areas, people that are going to figure out how, what kind of technological adaptations we need to uh, move Bitcoin to places like Africa, the Middle East, and so forth, uh, India, uh, stuff like that, and people that are going to help us circumvent the government rather than trying to interface that. I just want to respond to what Christoph was saying. You know, I think what I said earlier about having to confront or contend or I forget which word I used when it comes to governments and banks and and, um, and large corporations is that that's inevitable and there should be plenty of people doing exactly what Christoph just described and there should be people also, you know, who are there certainly will be people who are interested in change from within or at least functioning in the roles that I guess we've seen the foundation thus far has functioned uh, which is providing this kind of I call it a buffer I know that's not what their terminology is I don't really know how they would uh, describe it or, or whatever but to me it looks like a really convenient diversion for the kinds of um, efforts that Christoph alluded to and it's also a necessary um, role to play because there is that point of contact that you know states banks and large corporations are looking for with this new disruptive technology and uh, people want to fulfill that role and if there are people who formerly worked in government and see this amazing innovation and um, and uh, see it as a way of you know using their experience from working in in front of governments and within governments and things like that and now working in a role outside of that in a completely different world and you know I, those are people that um, they look like on paper are perfect for the job and hopefully their intentions are pure I think they I, we have no reason to suspect that they aren't uh, and pure intended people when it comes to protecting promoting and standardizing Bitcoin which is the mission of the foundation so if they can do that and communicate that with the interested uh, inquisitors you know banks, governments, and large corporations, then great. Hopefully they can do the great job of that while other people uh, do what Christoph alluded to, which is also important. 
I agree with Christoph. I'd like to see an international member added to the Bitcoin Foundation. Issue three. Sorry, banks. Millennials hate you. Millennials have huge debt, hate high fees, and will soon be coming into great wealth. And they're not going to be keeping it in banks. Half of respondents said they were counting on startups to overhaul how banks work. And three quarters said they would be more excited by technological financial services. Could hatred of banks lead to a love of Bitcoin? Does Bitcoin's hopes lie with the youths? Will Pangman. Well, I was briefly on the call, um, or, or no, rather it was a Facebook message that uh, one of Christoph's posts uh, earlier this week, or maybe yesterday even, um, about the arcane experience of receiving a check as payment. And I cannot help but uh, resoundingly agree with whenever I encounter these old paper tools, if it's not a paper wallet, it's just like another little brief wake-up call. The more you live your life within and using Bitcoin and things like that and involve yourself more directly with that ecosystem, when you have to step back outside of it, um, it's starkly obvious how antiquated and obsolete it already is, how painfully slow it is and all of these things. And I'm interested to just kind of uh, let Christoph open a can on this answer because uh, it's, uh, yeah, I really agreed with his, his post and the young are definitely, uh, obviously, first to be interested in technology. Um, it's attractive to them. It, it makes total sense. It's always been that way. Um, I'm really excited to do some projects with some college students who are already involved in college Bitcoin campus groups and things like that. Um, it's going to be really exciting. To I mean, I'm 31, and I'm going to, you know, I don't feel that old or whatever. I feel like I can hang with young kids, and it's going to be, I like the, the energy that they bring to this and just kind of, uh, I have tons of motivation and energy about Bitcoin and, and stuff, but even to see even more youthful energy than what I feel bubbling within is pretty cool and pretty motivating. Uh, so yeah, they, they're they going to carry us through on this. Um, again, their distaste for lots of antiquated uh, institutional, you know, rigid systems and stuff is to huge advantage of not only Bitcoin, but hopefully also healthcare innovation and and other necessary um, transportation disruptive technologies and all these kinds of things. Education, disrupting the institution of education. So these things are places that really need disruption and, um, and you know, Bitcoin is, at least from within, making me see that it's really obvious it's time to uh, see these old legacy systems go. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's do all we can to bring the youth along and, and um, help them do the same for their contingencies, their friends, their peer groups, um, the adults in their purview, and so on. And, you know, so on. Christoph, Atlas. Yeah, if you want to compare um, uh, Bitcoin with the existing banks, go to the App Store and look at the ratings for the blockchain.info app and compare that to the apps for you know, Wachovia, uh, Bank of America, and so forth. And uh, you'll see about a difference of about four stars, I would imagine. I think that uh, blockchain.info is probably about five stars. And uh, of course, you know, it's not even on the Apple Store anymore because the, you know, the existing interests decided they didn't want it there. And I think that they'll see that the, the bank apps are you know, right, sitting right around one star out of, you know, with a minimum of one. Um, and it, it's funny to see what the banks sort of congratulate themselves for accomplishing. Like, ah, oh, yes, but finally we've had our sixth version of this app, and finally customers can scan their checks without it crashing. They can get their their checks deposited and, and have their funds available at a snappy seven business days. And man, we are just doing fantastic, aren't we? Let's just give ourselves all a big pat on the back. Um, and meanwhile, Bitcoin's like, dude, we've been you know, scanning in QR codes since the beginning of Bitcoin. What the hell? What are you doing? You know, it's so it really it really shows you what kind of innovation is possible when you are a relatively free market company, and what's possible when you are part of this incredibly decrepit uh, old establishment uh, of these banks. Uh, it's really quite quite startling to notice the difference between the two, and you know, people say about the millennials and about young people, oh, they're so ungrateful, they, they, they can't, they're not happy with what they have. Um, Louis C.K. has this great uh, bit about, you know, uh, people 
flying and complaining about flying. He's like, you know, he's like, you're sitting in a chair that's in the sky, you know, what's it? Or, or like, you know, the guy that uh, is complaining about the online Wi-Fi, he's like, it needs to go, your cell phone needs to connect to space and then back. Can you just give it a sec to connect to space, you know, which I think is really funny, but I actually like that young people are so um, dissatisfied with the status quo and this brand new technology that they have because it means that they're going to demand and they're going to innovate for ever improving technologies. I think it's fantastic to not simply settle for whatever you have now. And the, the rate of technological progress is increasing uh, faster and faster and it, that's exactly the way that it should be. And uh, these old institutions like banks and I would argue governments are just going to get be left behind in the dust, and you know, good, rid good riddance to them. Megan, Lord. Of course, millennials hate the banks. These people traded our future uh, for endless wars and unlimited debt. It's terrible. And I've written on it. I've written a few articles for Bitcoin Not Bombs on it. One of them is called Bitcoin A Solution for Millennials. And then my most recent one uh, talks about how Bitcoin has literally helped some millennials be pulled out of poverty. Uh, because they were astute enough to invest their money early into this experimental technology. And that's what's really going to help us out of a lot of these problems that our generation faces, whether it's student loans or uh, you, you know, any of these other problems, is that they're open to new technology. So I got into this argument uh, at uh, this other, this libertarian leaning conference a few weeks ago with this older gentleman who was criticizing me and other Bitcoiners for not reaching out to uh, older people, which is kind of silly because uh, my day job is at a brokerage firm where that's basically our clientele and we're constantly, we're handing them out quick start guides. I mean, I do everything I can to reach out to anyone who's interested in Bitcoin. But what it comes down to at the end of the day is these older people are just not as interested in Bitcoin as these, up, as these younger people. And that's where I'm going to focus my time at. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, been messaging me lately. A lot of my friends and people in my generation are much more interested. They're like, what is this Bitcoin thing? Please tell me more about it. They're much more open to it. And it just makes sense. It's way easier to use. Uh, Will was mentioning checks and the kind of antiquated notion of getting this like weird piece of paper and then it takes like a week to clear in the bank. That's so archaic when I can just scan a QR code and my money's there. Or even I get, um, I found myself getting a little annoyed entering in a debit card number, a credit card number to buy something. It's like, ah, this is taking forever. And <laughs> And yeah, Bitcoin is is so far ahead of these uh, these institutions that have been set up, and it, Bitcoin is a huge threat to the banks. Millennials are would of course be wise to get into Bitcoin because these banks do not have our best interests in mind. They've stolen mil billions of dollars from people and enslaved people. It's it's disgusting what they've done. So they have every right to hate the banks and to disassociate from them. Uh, why can't you know? Why can't Bitcoin succeed? Why, why can't someone like Google create their own uh, payment system too? That's what people want to see, and that's going to be the direction things are heading. The thing is, a lot of millennials themselves may not even know this when I mention it to some of them, that we are the largest generation so far. That's huge. We have a lot more power than we think we do. Yes, uh, we don't have a lot of money, of course. Uh, a lot of us are trapped in student loan debt, but we have a lot of power in numbers. And that's a huge influencing factor for the direction of the future, and I think it's going to be very, very exciting. Exit question. How can we help the youth learn about Bitcoin? Contests? Giveaways? Word of mouth? Cartoons about the honey badger? Will Pangman. Well, this is... Um... I, I know I allude to working on this kind of a project a lot, and I'm hoping, uh, well, I'm already working on it, but I'm hoping it gets a lot more uh, support, and I think it will. And I guess the idea is to pull in uh, all of the existing groups that are run by students on universities or young people in communities and network them together and allow them to kind of self-determine a direction that's most useful for the whole network and certain places on the network, you know, what works in middle America may not work on the coasts and so on. Um, but um, 
to, to facilitate the creation of a kind of human network where these ideas can be brought to bear, um, crowdsourced and, you know, self-generated. Uh, and there's all kinds of ideas and strategies that I've seen meetups around the country put to great use. Some of these things are so easily portable and arguably far more effective in a college setting on a, like on a campus. And um, so doing things like that and also uh, doing it for professors and academia as well. Um, stimulating academic research in Bitcoin in all kinds of disciplines, not just engineering and computer science, um, but in economics and in sociology and philosophy and beyond, you know. And uh, this can be done. This is a project that's in the works at the moment, and um, it's uh, going to be an open source project. So, um, you know, it's, it's slow building, and uh, it's kind of taking a life of its own on its own. It'll happen one way or the other, whether or not it's well-coordinated, um, you know, whether it's just kind of isolated islands of communities doing their thing in their own area, or whether it's well-connected sort of network um, made up of people in the spirit of the decentralized Bitcoin network, which is kind of um, where I think we can really have a nice effect, especially with the these young people. Give them the tools to explain Bitcoin so that any background, affiliation, demographic, whatever, can understand it, more, more quickly, provide them with tools that facilitate the understanding, like a blockchain wallet. Um, it's unfortunate about the Apple Store. It was one of my outreach tools for, you know, so many people I encounter with iPhones or iOS devices. Give them Bitcoin, have them send it, and that is, you know, that's the 51% of the understanding right there. So um, that's... That's, I think, what we have to do. Let's, let's stimulate interest in the young people. Let's um, support the people who are already heavily invested and interested a among the young people and, um, and network everybody together, meet-up groups, college campus groups, uh, trade organizations, professional organizations, and, and get in front of people in the physical, in real life, in meet space, and talk to them about this in forums where, um, where their ears are open. That's, academia is a great forum for that. There's very few, there are some heavy biases in academia, of course. We can all point to some. But um, it's also probably one of the most uh, open-minded or critical thinking segments of society, too. So let's, let's find those pockets and influence them. Christoph Atlas. I think one way to bring youth into Bitcoin is going to happen inevitably when we start to incorporate Bitcoin into more stuff that youthful, youthful people use. So I'm thinking of, for example, the, the gaming industry. I think that there's a lot of applications for Bitcoin in that space. There was just um, there was a great interview uh, by Let's Talk Bitcoin. I think it was episode 86, yeah, where... Um, Adam did an interview with Richard Garriott about his MMO and possible integration of cryptocurrencies into their MMO economy. Imagine young people, uh, uh, and this is a very open kind of uh, model for an MMO where you can kind of provide services to other uh, players and actually get paid for it. So imagine a bunch of young people, they go home after school, and uh, they get on the game and they start you know, crafting stuff or... Uh, writing plays to be performed on the MMO, um, and they're getting paid in Bitcoin. Um, I think that's going to be hugely attractive to the youth. And something that the, the youth haven't quite caught on to yet, but they will, of course, is that cryptocurrencies are going to be hugely freeing for them because the existing forms of money that we have right now, parents tend to, it's, be, it's very easy for parents to control them. You can't get your own bank account unless you have a parent sort of co-sign on to the bank account. And of course, they can monitor anything that you do with the bank account. You can't get your own credit card. Um, you know, there's nowhere to like leave. You can't just like start accumulating cash and keep it under your bed, right? So young people don't have that much financial privacy right now. But with cryptocurrency, there's huge potential for young people to have their own money and no one can really stop them from doing it. How are you going to stop some kid from having a brain wallet? He doesn't even a damn. He doesn't even need a damn computer for it. So, I think that's going to be something that's hugely attractive to young people. Of course, they want to buy stuff. They don't want to have to get their parents to, you know, okay it necessarily. And uh, I'm, you know, vociferously uh, in favor of this kind of financial freedom for young people. I think it's fantastic. Megan Lords. 
Some offer a diversity of tactics. Uh, my favorite is what Will said, just saying, hey, let me open up a wallet for you and send you some Bitcoin. I really like the meetup approach, the face-to-face -face interaction. But I'd also like to see more uh, incorporation to the social media side of things. I really love how Twitter has these tipper coin apps for Feathercoin and Dogecoin and Bitcoin and you know, all of these different coins that are coming out. It makes it fun and exciting and you kind of need to focus on that too. I'd love to see something like that happen with Facebook. I'm not sure that it would um, or whatever new social media uh, source comes out, which I'm hoping something does come out to challenge Facebook and compete with that because I think that's also something that these younger people are going to be interested in. They're looking for something that's going to be the newest, coolest thing and if you could have a social network fueled by cryptocurrency, I think that would be awesome. I really like Kristoff's idea too about uh, the, the gaming aspect of it. I think that's really important. So uh, in different geographical locations are, are going to vary in how you can how you can approach people. I like I uh, when I meet someone who's interesting who's interested in cryptocurrencies, kind of getting to know them, finding out what's go what tactic is going to work best for them, you know, looking at them as an individual because uh, you'll find out what their interests are specifically because Bitcoin can be applied to such a wide variety of interests. You find out what that specific person is uh, into and, you know, you, you can find out what works for them uh, as far as getting them into Bitcoin. So yeah, diversity of tactics. Uh, you know, I, I, looking at people as, as individuals uh, who have individual goals in mind, and kind of making the connections with how Bitcoin can help them succeed. Moving on, issue four, Mount Gox again. No episode of the Bitcoin Group would be complete without Mount Gox. This week, their source code was leaked. Downloaders, beware! Trojans galore! A basic analysis says their code is horrible. They officially declared bankruptcy in the U.S., and now things are getting worse. Their identity verification database system may also have been stolen and is now for sale to the highest bidder. Is Mt. Gox the worst company in the history of corporations? Which is worse, the leaked source code, the bankruptcy, or the leaked identification database? Christoph Atlas. Well, I think that, uh, no, it's not the worst corporation. <laughs> um, it's certainly pretty bad. Um, I, I have a lot more, you know, dislike for corporations that are heavily, you know, subsidized and in bed with the government and stuff, not, which, which Mount Cox was not exactly. Um, I think that what interests me the most about this, this hack stuff, is the identity, the identities that were stolen. So the reason why Gox had these identities it was either to fulfill um, actual KYC requirements they had. KYC is know your customer. This is like government regulation requirements on businesses. Or it was some kind of KYC stuff that they were anticipating. They were anticipating they're going to need this stuff in the near future uh, in order to allow customers to do business with them. So I think we can expect that there are going to be thousands of identity thefts as a result of this hack. And who ultimately is responsible for these identity thefts? Not Mark Capelli's, not Mt. Gox, but the government. It's the people that put these KYC requirements in place that say to businesses, you absolutely must collect this information from customers, critical, you know, sensitive information, even though there's no way that you can possibly be trusted with it, even though you are turning yourself into a honey pot with a giant red target on your back for hacking to, you know, to steal these identities. Those are the people that are going to be responsible for the identity thefts. Now, of course, you know, Mt. Gox was hugely negligent in terms of their security and so forth, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that they would be, you know, collecting this information uh, just for their own personal interest because there'd be, there are lots of customers that simply decided not to do business with them. Um, on the basis that you had to do this kind of identity verification. I heard that from many, many, many people that I talked to in the Bitcoin space that said, no, I don't want to use Mt. Gox. I'm not going to send them my passport photo or whatever. So um, I think that's important to keep in, in mind is that uh, when people you know, have their identities stolen, and it may not happen right away, it might happen down the road, you know, 
it's there's going to be some pain associated with this hack. Keep in mind that ultimately the responsibility doesn't fall on Mt. Gox, in my opinion, at least. Megan Lords. So I was one of those people that saw when I. Uh, used Gox when I first got into Bitcoin, all of the identification requirements and stuff, and when they started to really kind of ramp that up, I, I thought it was very suspicious, and of course I figured that it was them covering their asses, you know, for the government regulations, but it definitely turned me off, and I was like, okay, I'm out, like, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to deal with this, like, if you want me to have to scan my license or my passport picture and give it to you, obviously that's a huge security problem. And I think it does come down to, it was Mt. Gox's fault too, though. There, it was their security issues. If you're going to have all of this information, all this very personal information being stored, you have to have top-notch security. And uh, whether this was intentional or just laziness and incompetence, either way, they still uh, are a lot to blame for this. Obviously, the regulations that caused them to uh, want to collect the information in the first place have a huge role too. I definitely agree with that, but this was extreme negligence and as someone who's had their, I, I've had my social security number stolen before, um, this was a long, long time ago too, before you know, you would be even putting this information on the internet. It, it, it's a very scary thing to have happen and it's and it's awful that if this information has been leaked by these hackers that they're basically trying to embezzle uh, money from people to get their information back. It's it's terrible that that's happening, but that's what you open yourself up to when you're not on top of your business, when you have all of this deeply personal information. Uh, so it's really, really disappointing, and I really, I, I don't know how it could be stopped at this point. Obviously, it's out of the control of the people who are affected by it the most, and I, I hope there's some resolution that can come, but I really feel for the people whose identities are out there now and can have this information stolen from them. This is extremely serious, and in order to prevent it from happening again, there, there's going to be a lot more self-policing that needs to be involved. There's going to be a lot more accountability um, that, that needs to happen. I, of course, when it comes to Bitcoin, a lot of that burden is placed on the individual, and I still think that's a feature, but these exchanges really need to be extremely careful. They, they must know their target, especially Gox. I mean, it's really just shocking that they didn't do more to prevent this from happening, knowing that they were, would be such a target for these uh, you know, malicious individuals. Will Pangman. Yeah, I you know I agree with both panelists' points about you know fault finding. Um, certainly, it's it appall. I'm appalled every time I think about the amount of profits that Gox was raking in at any given point of its operation, and that they never really reinvested meaningfully in security or in better infrastructure, or better due diligence practices. I mean, all of these things have had flaws over the years and you know people who've been around a long time have had plenty of warning and uh, I know Eric Voorhees was very public about his situation taking the risk he was aware of with with Mt. Gox and being hurt um, along with many other people and probably there were people who didn't realize the risk that they were taking with Gox but um, you know it's it's certainly their fault for not doing any of those things to improve their business. I mean, I just, I don't even know about that. And then, um, certainly, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's designed so that we can all conduct ourselves, you know, without identities needing to be revealed, private information required. I mean, that's the beauty of this thing, and here we are still, you know, storing private information on servers that we don't have control of. Um, so, I think it's we're going to grow out of that soon, but it should have been obvious from the start that you know these kinds of things. This is the point I always have to make to Bitcoin detractors or people who think they found something in the news that morning they can rub in my nose later that day or something like oh, I heard Bitcoin went bankrupt, ha ha ha. And it's like, <laughs> no, let's separate this bad company from this incredible technology. And um, Bad companies need to go away. So, what do, you know, the other often comment is, well, what about all these people? You need customer assurance and 
all these things. And it's like, well, you know, you're right. And I think we learned that lesson. And these people, you know, it was a lesson that had to be learned. And um, the two-bit idiot makes the point in one of his uh, conciliation uh, posts more recently that, um, you know, that's going to be the reason that the powers that shouldn't be attack Bitcoin is because these these things weren't in place and the warnings weren't there and the foundation knew and they should have warned and who knows. But, um, you know, I, I, I like to make the point, this is what happens in a free market. This is what businesses, bad businesses need to fail. This really resonates with lots of people from both sides of the aisle too. When they confront you with a under, you know, less than understanding of, of this uh, news because of, again, how it's delivered by the media. So, um, to make to make the point that you know bad actors are weeded out by the process of you know free enterprise and and this is what needs to happen you know where everybody's going to be better for it like look at all of the security measures that are being caused to you know innovations that were latent on the shelf that are now being implemented by data companies and tech companies thanks to the Snowden disclosures you know we've seen awesome steps that should be one indication that um, you know, privacy is important, and if we have technologies that preserve privacy, such as Bitcoin, such as encryption, and things like that, uh, why are we using them? You know, well, because it makes the internet harder to use, or the user um, education isn't there yet. Well, let's get it there. You know, and let's make it easier so it's harder to get it to that point. You know, let's make it easier to use, and all those things are happening now, thanks to Bitcoin, th thanks to Bitcoin frauds and thefts, thanks to um, the Snowden disclosures and excessive you know, egregious spying by, you know, uh, just the blanket uh, collect everything sort of um, sort of doctrine with the NSA and other intelligence bodies out there. So, yes, it's both, it's, it's the fault of both, you know. I, I wonder, you know, I'd like to have a discussion about whether or not some of these bridgings need to happen or if we could, from Jump Street, design a, you know, like if Mt. Gox was more uh, apt or more capable as a business and they didn't maintain you know uh, custodianship of your bitcoins uh, if that could have been something that happened earlier on because Bitcoin is a serverless thing that's great pretty much and here here are these companies relying on servers and asking to be trusted I'm sure that's largely because they had to cover their butts somewhere along the way in 2011 with the hack or who knows but um, could it have been this way from the start you know, or do we need to have the growing pains of, you know, unlearning the requiring of trusting third parties, you know, unlearning uh, the, you know, using of servers that we don't control, you know, relearning how to control your property. I think that's a great lesson that Bitcoin can teach everybody is it causes you to rethink this if you've never thought about it or practice it if you haven't yet had the arena in which to do so, and that is maintaining, you know, control over your own control and responsibility for your personal property. So um, it's so unfortunate with what happened here. Uh, the source code being leaked is a good thing. The identity thefts and then you know auctions are a really bad thing, and um, you know we're going to learn lots of lessons from it. And hopefully, it can, one can be you know control your keys and control your private property, manage. Assume self-responsibility for your private property. I, I do think this is one point where the uh, dot-com analogy is apt. We have a, a young company, rich with money, not rich with business experience or ideas on how to spend that money. The failure of Mt. Gox not to reinvest their riches back into their programmers, back into their infrastructure, back into their security, Having anyone but one person in charge of the entire system is why we've led to this failure. And I do think it was kind of necessary. Bitcoin was the Wild West. It's now being inhabited by people who are setting up towns. Of course they're going to check the records and see that things were a little fishy. Maybe we had a, a crazy Frenchman running the whole thing. 70% of our traffic going through his system. Well, we need to upgrade that. We need to change that. And that's happening now. So I think it's moving along. Moving along to questions and answers. Let's see if we have any questions and answers. Uh, it wants to invite someone. Uh, the Bitcoin Foundation should not charge for premium membership. That's a good point. 
Not sure about a question. Uh, kind of running out of time. Let's move on to predictions. Everyone's favorite part of the show, where I ask you to predict the future. Are you ready, Christoph Atlas? Come back to me in a moment. I'll be in another moment to come up with a prediction. Megan Lords. Okay. Um, I think there's going to be a an identity crisis leak coming from the government side of things that will make the situation that happened at Mount Gox pale in comparison. And we can say, hey, look, see, your information's not safe with these people either. Yes, Mount Gox was terrible, but look at how incompetent these people are over here. <laughs> I don't it's already know. starting to happen with Target. Target, I was about to say, it's, it happened with Target. I mean, that affected way more people than Mount Gox, not to downplay the you know, losses that people have incurred through Mount Gox, but yeah, I mean, it, it happened with Target. That's extremely serious, especially you know, during the holiday season and all of that. That's, that's a much bigger deal, I think, than um, you know, the much smaller percentage that was affected through Mount Gox. Let, let me comment on that for a moment, right? So I got a, a letter from the state of South Carolina just a, a little while ago. Oops, uh, you filed some taxes with us. Um, someone uh, hacked all of our stuff, and they got a dump of every taxpayer in South Carolina. Uh, don't worry, though. Um, we're going to give you some free identity protection service if you fill out form A, B, D, C, F, and Z, and uh, notarize it, and... Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, at least with Mt. Gox, if someone stole my identity, I had the opportunity to voluntarily choose whether I was going to do business with Mt. Gox, whether I'm going to send them a copy of my li my license or whatever. With the state of South Carolina, I didn't have that opportunity. They didn't, they didn't ask me, like, hey, uh, we'd like to keep some of your information on file. Do you still want to file your taxes this year? Um, so that's, you know, an interesting difference between... Uh, those two types of organizations. And in terms of scale, I believe that this state uh, leak was much, much larger than what was happening with Mt. Gox. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'll add another comment, kind of just agreeing with the prescient Megan Lords there. Yeah, healthcare.gov. I still read stories about how insecure that website is. And, of course, the kinds of private information you have to supply to sign up there, and there's, I guess, 4 million sign-ups now um, with the goal of 7 million. So 4 million may sound like a lot, but they're, they're well short of their goal at this point. Who knows? But that certainly seems like a disaster. It's been a disaster for a long time. I think uh, it's window dressing to get it as far along as it is. And, make you know, I'll concur with Megan's prediction. My prediction will be another slow news week. Thank God. Um, <laughs> can take a few breathers. Uh, so yeah, my prediction is next week we'll have a, another slow-ish news week. Um, you know, maybe Two Bit Idiot can give us something interesting to think about again. But um, yeah, hopefully we can all uh, you know just take the blinders off a little bit. Christoph Atlas, any prediction? Yeah, um, I think that even though Mt. Gox royally screwed up, right? And they, they, they still, I bet we still haven't heard the end of them screwing up. They're going to find another way to do it. It's going to be during the bankruptcy proceedings or, or whatever, or it could be related to Gox coin or all these other uh, people that are hoping to actually extract some value out of Gox for their, for their customers. We're going to hear about them again. But um, overall, the, the, the arc of this story is going to be about... Um, you know, how we were using some very questionable businesses early on in Bitcoin, but then the rest of the exchanges uh, learned their lessons from this. They took technological steps and business steps to, um, you know, adopt best practice standards to demonstrate that they have their reserves, that they're keeping uh, customers' funds safer from theft than they have in the past. They were going to see more and more decentralized exchanges uh, come into the marketplace. And it's, go it's going to be a story about how the marketplace learned from a very bad experience and from a series of calamities that will be linked with not only one you know, very incompetent, uh, short-sighted CEO, but also the kind of regulatory pressure that they were feeling and experiencing uh, while they were trying to be led by this mad 
uh, you know, captain of the ship. Excellent. Distributed and non-centralized. Bitcoin exchanges of the future will not be run by one person in one place. They'll be decentralized. They'll be everywhere and yet nowhere, all at once. Distributed Bitcoin exchanges, coming soon. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.